from this. He has uh, lectured in law and is a director of companies. Mr. Sabir will speak on the, on the topic financial services without red tape. Mr. Sabir. <laughs> Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, when I was asked to come and talk here, the person who talked to me, requesting me to, to come and participate here, had a long debate with me because I preferred that we have an argument as to whether the financial services of this country should be regulated or deregulated. And the person I was arguing with said to me, why do you lawyers always want to argue? <laughs> well, uh, today I'm not here to argue, but uh, to exchange a few views with you. And by the same token, I'm not here to give a law lecture because once you give a law lecture, you find that you're lecturing to your own lecturers. Thanks God, I'm told that Professor Tega is gone. I see Carmen Nathan is still here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, as a basis, I should outline the financial institutions of this country and how they operate and within what laws do they have to operate. And then from there, later on, analyze their position as against the consumer, their ultimate customers. This country, you have a set of statutes that governs the banking industry. And it is this thick statute that has categories of various banks. And we have institutions like a general bank, a commercial bank, and uh, an investment bank, what in this country is called a merchant bank. Now, all these categories have got their own sphere of business where they operate. They have their own limitations. and it then follows that uh, within the limitations, one cannot exceed and go to another category where you're not allowed to operate, <coughs> lest you become prosecuted and your banking license gets withdrawn. For example, if you're a general bank, you cannot perform most of the services that are offered by a commercial, commercial bank. Now, this is one set of statute. Now, over and above the statute, there are also regulations that are promulgated in terms of this, uh, this act. Now. On the other counterpart, you have a statute that regulates the building societies, those institutions that are more into mortgage finance. I'm sure you have all heard about the big fight that was between the building societies and the banks recently. And uh, I believe that uh, the banks have actually won the battle. Now, this is another statute with its own regulations, which basically governs the building societies. Now, with the recent amendment, Obviously, their functions complement each other to some extent, as at today. Then you have the insurance companies, which are also governed by various laws. And they also have their own functions, which are limited in nature. And uh, to some extent, some of the things they can do and some of the things they cannot do. Now, a while ago, when the amendment to the Banks Act was debated, I was sitting with this managing director of a reputable bank, and we were basically arguing about the pros and cons of the new amendment. And uh, it then was clear to me that I was not driving the point that I was trying to drive home. And I gave him this set of statutes to read. And uh, having read and having basically distinguished one point, I then asked him to refer to, reg to the regulations of the Act and see if uh, he could then reconcile his argument and put his question across. This director got upset, and he said to me, why do you lawyers always want to put things in language that is beyond human understanding? Now, the argument for that is that the regulations are there to protect the consumer. And uh, unfortunately, some of the legislators tend to over-regulate, which then has certain repercussions on the consumer. It is arguable whether these regulations are necessary in financial institutions or not, whether the consumer actually needs to be protected or not. Uh, President Carter, when he took over office in the States a while ago, was trying to argue for deregulation of the financial services, and there was an uproar from the existing institutions because they thought that they would run out of business. They thought that the informal sector would then take over the business and shut them down. And he did this by way of a model. He asked the secretary generals of each department
to recite the regulations. And he said, no man can go and enforce a law that he himself does not know. And none of them, I bet, could recite all the regulations. What I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that some of the regulations that are there are actually useless regulations. They're there in statute, but uh, nobody supervises them. And by the same token, whilst they are in in intended to protect the consumer, they have no purpose in protecting the consumer. In fact, they tend to restrict the growth of the industry. They tend to affect the consumer adversely, and they should be done away with. Now, in banking sector, the biggest commodity that a bank has or any financial institution has is money. And they obviously derive their profits from the interest. And uh, in this country, there is a law called the Usury Act, which basically regulates what kind of interest one institution can have and what kind of interest one institution cannot charge. That is related, obviously, to the amount that one is lending at the time. And there is only one person who has been appointed in terms of the act to say what kind of interest rate should be chargeable. That is the Minister of Finance. He, from time to time, by way of promulgation, the Government Gazette will say how much interest is chargeable. I'm sure that uh, some consumers, when they go and look for a service from a bank, if somebody buys a car, he hardly checks what interest rate is charged to him. And I know that recently the members in the judicial sector, especially the magistrates, have been given a strict regulation to check in each and every civil suit involving financial service to check whether the interest rate which has been charged is in fact in compliance with the law. Now, is there a real need for this country to regulate the interest rate that is charged from time to time? The government argues that this is intended to protect the consumer and that there are people who are unscrupulous who will charge very, very high interest rates. And as a result to them, in their own thinking, talking about the government this time, this will be a highway robbery. Now, this leads to adverse economic circumstances. If you're dealing with an established bank, for example, which has been subjected to this regulated economy over the years. And uh, they know basically how they have the money to pay firstly to go and get proper advice from professionals. Number two, they know how to get around these regulations. Now one remains with a society or an economic society of the regulated class. And those people that are regulated do not want to be deregulated. And they, they do not want the people who are coming into the industry as well to come and interfere with them. On the other side of the coin, if you think in the rural area somebody knocks in a home where possibly there is very little education and he says there is an emergency and he wants a loan for a thousand rand. This person probably has never been seen in that, heart bef in that house before, has no collateral at all, and there's a possibility he might die, maybe he has no insurance, let alone to say that if he has one, he, they probably don't know that the insurance can be ceded as security for the loan. Americans propounded an econo economic theory that if you're in business, if there is high risk, there must be high return. Now, by the same token, therefore, if one talks about a deregulated financial system, the possibilities are that whilst there will be very high interest rates, there could also be very low interest rates. There will be people who will go into the industry without fear of prosecution or breaking any other law and will lend money at high interest rate, but there will be people who will also put them into active competition as a result that they will then force, they are then forced to lower their interest rates. What the free economic forces tend to do is to activate competition. I'm not trying to suggest that there is no competi competition in this country. There is competition, but uh, my submission is that it is not a very active competition. And in fact, it is competition amongst the group, which is also a regulated group, the privileged group. And I dare say as well that one reason why we have 
very high interest rates those countries because competition is very limited. And again, the entry into the interest industry is made absolutely very, very difficult. To own a bank is not, is not something fantastic. A while ago, when I just qualified, I got a shock of my life when we were trying to register a bank. And this family that wanted to register a private investment bank, firstly, had to be quoted on how much it costs to register a company. And because there was some agency, and uh, we were told by the powers that being that it was advisable to buy an old existing company which has credibility. It was better therefore to buy an existing company and we identified a dormant company which was raised at some time in 1926 presumably, presumably had some kind of credibility and the cost of the company alone was 50,000 rand. Now the second phase is to apply for a banking license which we didn't, we're not sure whether we're going to get or not. Now, what people tend to do these days is try and identify institutions with their domain banking licenses and buy them. And uh, these are not very cheap commodities. And one we're talking in the region of 5 million rand for a piece of paper which says, I am a banking, I'm a bank, I'm entitled to operate. Now, if you take the other option to register a bank, possibly one could afford to pay legal fees to register a bank. But uh, one will have to anticipate the red tape that one has got to go through the various departments. But the biggest real problem is to provide the securities that are required. This is all in the interest of helping the consumer. Now, I've not been asked here only to talk about banks alone. I've also been, my topic says I should talk about financial services without the red tape. Now, having talked about institutions for a moment, let me then talk about the consumer. There is one point which is a very sore point that I must raise. In this country, the mode of checking credibility for a prospective customer to any financial institution is very outdated. You find that if you're checking a man, whether he is credible enough to get a loan from a bank, in this country we still use the outdated method of going to check from one of the institutions. In the old days, it would be done in Broad Street. That I believe they have now changed, they changed some months ago to the Credit Bureau. I'm now told that there's what is called the Information Trust Corporation, which is somewhere in Park Town. Now what they then do is they get a printout of this man, and what a bank manager normally will look for is to look for judgments, civil judgments that uh, have been recorded against this individual. Now how many people regard pieces of paper, legal documents that are served to them as serious pieces of paper? And if they do, how many people know that they have a right to go and defend that? And other people will feel that maybe they're not sufficiently legally equipped to do it on them, for themselves, and they go to solicitors. And solicitors, solicitors are not cheap commodities these days. It happened to me a while ago when I was actually appointed as an executor of some gentleman who was Jewish who stayed in Bryanston. And uh, somebody obvious was upset that he had not been paid, and someone was issued against Jabu Subia in his capacity as an executor of this estate. And someone was served somewhere in Bryanston, I live in Soweto, and I was totally unaware of it. And uh, when I tried to change a car, that my bank manager told me that there was in fact a judgment that is recorded against me, and therefore I did not qualify for finance. These are one of the few outdated modes of checking a man's credit worthiness. Can I tell you as an alternative what other countries do, which I think would offer an alternative? If a client approaches a financial institution for a loan, what you are concerned with as a bank manager or an official of the bank is whether he will be able to service your capital <coughs> together with interest. So basically what you look at is the income that he has per month or per week depending how the loan is payable. Whether he has judgments, civil judgments against his name or not, that could be material in case they relate to an issue for payment of money. And I think that note does say what kind of judgment is that. And you find that time and again, a person has a judgment, but he has already paid a financial institution in full. So that piece of paper is in fact immaterial. Talk again about the consumer. 
One finds that because of all these outdated modes of checking a man's creditworthiness, that it takes a long, long time for a person to actually get an answer whether he in fact is getting the financial service or a loan that he's asking for or not. There are interest rates that keep on going up time and again, and their men's uh, financial circumstances do change. If this country would perhaps go to a mode where a person could be able to be informed of his application within a reasonable time, I don't expect the impossible in the States. I know that you apply for a loan and you're told within 15 minutes because everything is on computer whether you qualify or not. This might be different. We're in the third world and third, things in the third world are, are, are different. But obviously if you apply for a loan, it takes three weeks for you to be informed whether you qualify or not. That could be an exercise in futility. There are instances where it takes more than a month to be inf informed whether you qualify for a loan. Certain institutions that cater for small business people actually require even feasibility studies. One wonder why a person in the third world would come and, be, and behave as if he's in the first world. These are the all red tapes that one encounters in the financial services. If one were to basically give a brief prognosis of what would happen if the financial services were totally deregulated, I know it's a fact that the late Dr. Dick Koch, the former governor of the Reserve Bank, was moving towards a freer <coughs> financial economy. I know it's a fact that sometime in July when he actually addressed the meeting of the University of Devon Westville, he did mention that. But my major criticism is that he was making a few concessions which did not materially benefit the consumer as the end user. And those concessions were very limited. And in fact, the concessions which he was, he was making would still not have any material effect on the banking world. What one needs to do is to have a totally deregulated society and the economic forces should then regulate the interest rates that are chargeable, the nature of the service that is rendered, and the quality of the service as well. And if one has that, there is very, very active competition. And obviously, the institutions that are currently involved that are reaping the benefits of regulating of regulations, which are referred to as the regulated class, will oppose that vehemently because they tend, they have something to lose, and uh, some of their profits will then be lost, and again, they will, op they, they will oppose it. Again, you'll find that there will be more and more people who will be entering the industry. There's no reason in this country why we have a concentration of institutions in a few centers. Well, one assumes that uh, it's because there's a lot of business in that center, but there's no reason why we don't have a private bank, for example, for the community of Paris in the Free State, the Investment Bank of Paris because that is very, very difficult to do. A gentleman by the name of Richard Gilbert, who at one time was the president of the United States League of Savings Associations, had this to say, talking about deregulating the financial service. In my judgment, we are already an overregulated society. Often intended benefits are not forthcoming and the cost of regulations is generally expensive. Many regulations are counterproductive. Unless the regulatory framework is changed for a regulated depository institutions, the non-regulated sector may as well take over. For the regulated sector, the outlook is bleak. Now, we live in a formal society where we have regulations that have been showered on us time and again, and nobody questioned these regulations. And if a few people questioned these regulations, nobody listened to it. Now, we are now in a position as consumers to say, we are fighting for a deregulated economy. And in my view, the government should listen. This will alleviate the interest rates that the consumers are paying this country. And uh, recently I was having a chat with a business person from Taiwan who was reco re relocating his factory to this country. And he asked me what sort of interest rates 
does one pay in this country? And I said to him, well, if you're talking about LIBOR prime, you're talking 20%. And he said, prime 20%? I said, yes. And uh, normally for good customers in any institution, one will be talking a or 10, you will be talking interest rates of uh, approximately prime plus four, maybe 24%. Well, it goes these days, it goes up to about 32%. And he says, how are you people able to run business in this country? How are you able to survive? And uh, I didn't ask him how much in Taiwan it cost because I've been there recently. And I was shocked to find that the Bank of Communications, which was charging the highest interest rate there, was charging about 8%. Now, one wonders how we're going to survive with this high interest rate in this country. One wonders what has to be done. Once one bears in mind that there is inflation to fight and there are other factors to take into account, but something drastic has got to be drawn, done about high interest rates in this country. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, i like to mention that it is the social desirability of an expanded consumer protection can be assessed largely in terms of use that government has made of its historical regulatory powers. We must mistrust any consumer proposal, not because government is inherently evil, but because much technical research and everyday experience has shown that in the name of consumer protection, the consumer has been exploited by special interest groups seeking to improve their own economic position behind the veil of government regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Sevilla. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we come to question time, I ask you please, when you speak, to identify yourself and your company or organization. And we wondered whether it might be a good idea that if you um, wish to speak, if you could make a move towards the, um, the mics so that, in fact, um, we could have more questions fitted in, more time for talking than having to wait for people to get to the mic. This one. I have one here to start off the um, start the ball rolling to Dr. Ben Phil from Margaret Tefu. From all what you've read about insurance taxation, one in brief, how would you explain this to a lame customer consumer? And two, is there any way that it can help a consumer? Please explain in full. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to dominate here, there, then. I've got no. half a dozen here. No, okay. yes. uh, no, they're all for you. First of all, uh, the insurance. To, how, when, how does one explain in brief uh, to a, a lame? You've written L A M E. I, I assume you mean L A Y. Uh, a lay consumer. I, I would say we have so much difficulty in understanding it ourselves. It's practically impossible to explain if we're talking about the sixth schedule which was my subject this afternoon and frankly I'm not exaggerating when I say that uh, the uh, the uh, supervisory authorities themselves have much difficulty and much argument in, in actually uh, applying the sixth schedule and there are many differences in practice across the country so I think all that one needs to say is that uh, if one wants to make a single premium payment to a life insurance company, there's a great prospect that the proceeds of your policy will be taxable when you receive them. Other than that, uh, you're required to pay premiums for at least 10 years and they, they, you know, mostly you have a chance of receiving your proceeds tax-free if the, the term of the policy is 10 years or more. I guess that's the simplest explanation. Um, Secondly, you say, is there any way it can help a consumer? Well, I would say that the only way we can really help the consumer is by doing what I think many of us have recommended here today, and that is uh, further deregulation of our entire economy and the scrapping of the sixth schedule is the best way that I can think of that we could help both the industry and the authorities and, of course, our consumers ultimately who always pay these expenses in the long run. Would you like uh, to feel yes. these two as well? I have, I have some more here. Countries with lower tax rates generally generate or promote greater prosperity for their citizens. Is this true? How? Please explain with examples. <laughs> well, I will try. I, I, I'm certainly not, not uh, much of an economist, but, uh, and there are several economists here today, including uh, 
uh, some well-known people, so I, I, I shan't embarrass myself. But is it true that uh, lower rates of tax generally promote greater prosperity? I think there's little doubt of that. Uh, when you take money away from people and put it in the hands of government, it usually spends that money in a non-productive or a less productive way than would have been expended by the individual. Alternatively, it becomes consumption expenditure instead of investment expenditure, which might have been the case if that was surplus in the hands of individuals. But generally speaking, by taking money out of the hands of individuals and putting it into government, you tend to have less efficiency in, the, in your economy and less efficiency, of course, leads to less, uh, less uh, prosperity for citizens. Um, the other question that I have is, what tax advantages or concessions are there in close corporations for the small businessman? Ooh, I really, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, qualified to answer that without notice. Mr. Sabir, uh, uh, Oh, Mr. Sabir can help me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The question here is what tax advantages are there in closed corporations for the small businessman? I should just indicate to you that there are, there are tax advantages in the closed corporation, whether you, you, you're a big or a small businessman or a woman. The whole idea why the Closed Corporations Act was introduced was that uh, companies were paying too much tax. You'll understand that if you're a company or a closed corporation, both of them, the net amount of profits that you make at the end of the tax year get taxable. And uh, at the moment, the current rate is 50% for companies and for also for closed corporations. So if, for example, if you made a profit of 200,000 rand per year, at the end of the tax year, 50% of that will then be company tax. So you're talking paying to the receiver of revenue half of that, which is about 100,000 rand. Now, over and above what you declare as a dividend, what comes to your pocket as an individual, you're a shareholder in a company or you're a member of a closed corporation, what comes to you, to your pocket, then becomes income that accrues to you at, during that tax year that also attract is, attracts income tax. So the whole idea of having a closed corporation is that all the dividends accruing from the closed corporation are not taxable in the hands of the individual, the shareholder, the member. So that is a big tax concession that one has. Because in the company situation, one has an element of what I call double taxation. It's not actually double taxation. You have invested in a company, and uh, at the end you make 200,000 rand, 100,000 rand gets paid to the receiver of revenue, and you, maybe there are two shareholders, and you declare a dividend, and you both get 50,000 rand each. The amount of money that comes to your pocket then gets taxable according to the normal income tax rules. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sabir, there's another one for you. Would you like to read it out and then reply, please? Would you like to speak from your chair or from the podium? question is directed to me, it doesn't say where it comes from. It comes from Alice Tukulu, Pick and Pay Industrial. She says, who checks the credibility of the consumer? Well, anybody can check, but uh, normally in normal business transaction, transactions, the person that you're dealing with will normally check. And in fact, I have noticed that in South Africa, people are not into checking the credibility of other people. In other countries, especially in Asia and UK and in the States, before you do business with any other person, you want to be in a partnership, you're architects or a law firm, you want to go and open up a takeaway shop. The first thing you do is to check creditability. How you check, if you're in this country, you'll obviously go to the ITC. Alternatively, the, the, I think the basic way of checking basically is to get a man's bank record. If you have a transaction to do and uh, you get a bank referral and the bank will tell you if uh, he's a sound businessman or not, whether he's worth any pinch of salt or, or sugar. So anybody can check, but uh, obviously the person you're doing, do, doing business with will go and check. If you're doing business with the bank, the bank will, all, will go and check you out. The second question says, if you were nominated to stand surety for a person, 
should that person not be able to pay his or her credit? Can judgment be made against you, thus making it impossible for you to get credit from a financial institute? Now let me explain, if you stand surety, surety means that basically you're standing as a guarantor, you're guaranteeing somebody's indebtedness. If you stand surety for a person, normally the person, the, what is called the, the creditor, will then have certain rights to go and recover the debt from the principal debtor, the person who's actually borrowing the money. Then you're then guaranteeing the loan as a guarantor to say that this man will discharge all his obligations. If he doesn't, I will step to his shoes and then I'll make right his obligations. Now, whether the creditor can come directly to you or not depends on the wedding or the kind of surety that you have entered into. If you've entered into a surety and you have excluded certain benefits, there are benefits which are basically legal protections. There's one called the benefit of excursion. Most of these uh, bank forms have a long Latin word but uh, you can actually, actually see that it means excursion. Excuse means that you must go and exhaust all your remedies against that fellow or that person before you come to me. So if you have not waived, if you're standing a surety, you have not waived the benefit of excursion, it means that the bank cannot come directly to you before going to the principal data. However, if that has been waived, it means that the bank can either pounce on you or the or, or, or or one of you or both of you at the same time. Except for the fact that obviously having, having paid the bank, you then have the right of recourse against the, the person that you st stood surety for. I'm not sure if I answered not sufficiently. Mm. Thank you. I have one here which is um, addressed just to the panel and perhaps you gentlemen would choose who would like to answer it. Is there any justification for regulating a contract between two people? one lending and one borrowing, or is common law of contract adequate? <laughs> when you have a contract between two or three people, depending what kind of contract that is, uh, there will be certain essential elements of a contract that uh, will have to be agreed upon, failing which the contract becomes invalid. Now, the question is whether a third party could be involved. Uh, there are other contracts that involved, not, on, not only two people could involve a third person. I'm thinking, of, for example, of a contract for the benefit of a third party. You know, you and I enter into an agreement, and uh, as one of the terms of the agreement is that uh, you will then have to pay a certain amount at a certain time, but you don't pay to me, you pay to my daughter. So there are three people involved, yeah. But the question says, is there any justification for a third, for regulating a contract between two or more people? Now, you must bear in mind that when you enter into a contract, the contract should fall within the bounds of the law, and the law should always be obeyed. And once you formulate a contract which goes beyond the term of the law, then that contract is invalid. So if, for example, I've mentioned to you various acts and various regulations, if they are not obeyed, and then that gets invalid. I have one example in mind. I'm trying to put a legal idea through in lay terms. If, for example, I lend money, I'm a bank, I lend money to you, and the regulations in terms of the usual act says, I can only charge up to 28% interest, and I decide to charge 32% interest. Now, there will be certain remedies that you'll be entitled to because obviously I over, overstepped my limitation in terms of law. And uh, one will have to look as to whether that contract per se will be a valid document or not. I have one here from Margaret Emmett of Housewives League. It's directed to Dr. Benfield. Will the huge amounts, with the huge amounts of money flowing into the insurance companies, 33 million per day to Old Mutual alone, is there any way in which these companies will enter the mortgage bond lending market, hopefully bringing down the mortgage interest rates to the benefit of consumers? You don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be more <laughs> Do you want to speak, Tom? Okay. 
sorry I seem to be dominating the floor, but uh, these questions seem to be legal questions and I'm a lawyer by training and by practice, so I think I'm entitled to answer them. The Insurance Act at the moment is a stance, an insurance company cannot basically go and lend out money for mortgage finance. Uh, the reason being that uh, depending what kind of insurance company you're dealing with, and you find that, uh, make an example, an institution like Old Mutual, which was raised at, uh, in terms of an act which was passed in 1936, I think it's called the Mutual Societies Act, it's called. Now, the person who owns, well, I can think of another example that would be Colonial Mutual, which is King Sparkling in disguise. Uh, the, those companies are actually owned by the policy holders. So if you take a policy with Old Mutual, for example, you then own part of the policy holders' funds in the Old Mutual. And whosoever chairman or the board of directors have got to look after the interests of the policy holders. So they can't directly can go and lend to finance an individual to, in terms of the mortgage bond. But what they do is they look for projects which will give a good return for the policyholders' money. So if, for example, they try and avoid to go to the venture capital section of the stock market, they will most of the time go to manage portfolios. Uh, then you find insurance companies that uh, are privately owned, their companies, and they're, they're owned, their shareholders. However, those companies, I think in terms of the accounting rules, have got to have a policyholders' fund this is a fund that guarantees you that in case you have a claim, you'll be paid. So that what happened a few years ago when one insurance company went insolvent and people remained unpaid. So whilst there are shareholders, as regards the shareholders' money, they can do what they are entitled to do within the in terms of the Insurance Act. But as regards the policyholders' money, which is uh, usually a huge chunks of money that they cannot touch unless it is to the benefit of the policyholders. I think I've got another one that I'll probably end up by giving to you again. <laughs> um, as a request in connection with the bond rate increase, it says the payment of a loan for a house is adjusted according to one's income. How is one expected to pay, to pay the bond rate? Why is it that income tax is the same but pensions are not the same? I don't quite understand the question. Would anybody like to... Comment. Who is the person who um, put the question? Could they perhaps expand on it themselves? Because I don't really quite understand it. Who is the lady? I think it's Winnie Sarovi. I don't understand what she means. about the increase in the bond rate. It's because um, I find many blacks very frustrated by this increase of the bond because the, the, the original contract that was signed for payment was adjusted according to the income of an individual. And when the rate is increased uh, without the, the, the income being increased, I find it to be frustrating. I don't know whether I'm Yes, no, I know what you mean. Would you like to speak on that one? Yes, if, and, a, and you give your second part too, please. And then the second question is that uh, the taxes are the same, but the, the pensions, for instance, the, the old age pensions are not the same. So I just wanted to find, to know why? Why is it that we pay the same tax, but the pensions are not the same? Why is there discrimination when it comes to pension, but when it comes to tax, there isn't? The first part of the question, I'll attempt to deal with it as follows. But firstly, as a consumer, when you go and apply for a loan, I think the first thing you must determine is what interest rate that institution will give to you. And if it does give to you, you must find out whether it's a floating interest rate or, it's the, or whether it's a fixed interest rate. What I mean by that is that there's what, the bank, what, what is called prime rate, which is uh, the minimum amount that banks charge at the moment. And uh, if your bank manager says, I'll charge you a floating rate, at the moment I'll charge you 1% above prime, and you ask him whether this is fixed, it means is this for the whole term of the transaction or not. 
And if he says to you, it's floating, um, uh, forget the technical terminology they use, it means that it's going to be adjusted from time to time, regardless of whether you can afford it or not afford it. Uh, if the prime rate changes, then it does affect you. Uh, what normally happens as well is that uh, if you're giving a rate which is good, you know, assuming that uh, you get on very well with your bank manager, and then you ask him if you can make it a fixed rate, and you find that that rate stays forever until the end of the transaction, whether the prime changes or not. Uh, as to whether we can afford it or not, obviously that's another question, and uh, you know, I think possibly the bank manager will take into account what you can afford at the time you apply for a loan, but they will disregard the rest of the period when we have already qualified for a loan. The second part of the question says, why is income tax the same but pensions are not the same? Uh, until recently, I think a few years ago, income tax in this country is now uniform. It means that if you're white or black or pink or yellow, you pay the same amount of tax according to the tax tables, depending on obviously what, what, what rebates you have and what uh, exclusions you have. In the old days, there used to be, I think it was called the Bantu tax law, which had a very, very low tax rate. And you find that I think most educated people or members of the economy felt that blacks were not contributing enough to the economy. And they felt that as well, blacks were discriminated against by being asked to pay very little taxation. The anomaly, um, anomalies of this, of this law was that if you black, you could be, at the time before, the uniformity, that you could be very rich, you know, extremely rich, but you will pay next to nothing. But you could be very poor and pay a lot of tax. Now the laws are now uniform and we all pay the same tax, tax according to the income categories. Regarding pensions, I don't know much about pensions other than knowing about pension funds. I don't know possibly about the state pensions. I think I've read the papers that uh, the state pension for blacks is very low as against that one for other population groups. Why it is so, I do not know. I think uh, there is an element of uh, racial discrimination there. But that's all uh, I can say, I think, about that. I think perhaps you can probably help us with that one, Mr. Sabia. Shall we ask the person to stand up and um, could I ask please, is it Mr. Ngamalo from Safacon? Oh, would you, um, could you put it um, verbally please, we were not, don't quite understand what you, you mean in your written question. Use the other one over there. I'm specifically referring this to Mr. Jabasivia. Do we have an act or regulation which gives a blocked customer, if, if you say, who, who doesn't have credit worthiness, power to cancel or reverse the blockage, even only if he has paid up his debt? In other words, can you regain credibility? That's it. If there's proof that you've paid up the debt, or you remain blocked for a certain period. Can you regain your credit no. worthiness? In fact, uh, once, uh, once you're not credit worthy, maybe there's a judgment against you or not. I think this is the custom in this country for financial institutions not to, to give you any more credit. Now, there's no act of parliament which says uh, you can regain your credit. However, how things are done is that uh, if uh, you have a judgment, you can apply for what is called a rescission, which means that they're going to erase the judgment against you. And you either do that through the clerk of the court who does it free of charge or through a solicitor who charges a certain amount of money to do that. Alternatively, what you then do is you approach the person who has a judgment against you and say, can you abandon, can you relinquish this judgment, which gets noted in the court file. I know that uh, the banks recently refused to abandon any, any judgment, but uh, other institutions still do agree to abandon judgments. I think we're, we're more or less running out. I have one here which is um, more a comment, and I think perhaps um, the gentleman from the free market could be able to help us. There is the question, were any government officials invited today? 
This would have been an excellent platform for government officials to taste the thoughts of the real opportunities of free market and trade. It comes from Gwyn Main of the Sunnyside Group. Can you say anything on that, Terry? Thank you, Madam Chair. I can inform you that notices were sent to virtually all the uh, various government departments to tell them about this conference. Uh, we, as the organizing committee, decided specifically that we would not have uh, politicians or cabinet ministers and so on rep uh, talking on this platform. You may or may not disagree with us, but that, that was a decision we took. Um, before I ask um, Leon Lowe, who would like to expand on one of the questions, um, this one here is from Joan Battis Battersley. Would you please explain why it was that before the recent rate of, of interest rates took off to the present high levels, the government held back from raising the rates in spite of clamours from the various financial institutions? Eventually, of course, the government had to give way. Why? Apart from the fact that it tied in with fiscal and monetary policy, can anybody add anything more to that? <laughs> with an election coming. Dion, would you like to expand on your? And then I think that is the um, end of our story. Somebody asked, uh, the very first question was, uh, do, is there, do countries with lower tax rates have higher economic growth? And Brian said he didn't know, which means he's very naughty because he didn't read uh, Francis in my latest book, Let the People Govern. <laughs> <coughs> now, I can fit this confounded thing on here. We have on page 102, and incidentally, if you want all the answers to all your problems, what you do is you buy the book outside and read it. Everything. But what this is, one of the things we have is a chart which shows the growth rate for countries of the world on that axis and the tax rates on that axis, the amount of tax collected by governments. And what you find is a very interesting and to totally consistent pattern. There's a 100% correlation. That is, there are no countries in the world with high tax and high growth, and there are no countries in the world with low tax and low, and low growth. In other words, all low tax countries have high growth and all tax, high tax countries have low growth. South Africa has shifted from the middle down to there, that is from the 70s to the 1980s. And we are now, in fact, this year we're off this chart, we're not even on it anymore. <coughs> and uh, that is, we are now more highly taxed, for example, than Jamaica, Zaire, Zambia, Zimbabwe, all sorts of supposedly Marxist or socialist countries. Uh, another interesting and instructive important thing I must point out is that it has nothing to do with any other variable. Uh, in the top half there are three black African states, Malawi, Cameroon and Mauritius. In the bottom half there are three, Zambia, Zaire and uh, 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 where I guess South Africa will have to keep going. Um, the, uh, it, it is an absolutely 100% correlation. There is one thing and one thing only that generates growth in the world and that's low what I call government participation rates. So that is the pattern, we've just got a sample of countries here, but all countries in the world fit into that band over there. Most countries in the world are now moving upwards. South Africa with about half a dozen others are moving downwards. Terry, would you like to wrap? Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you very much indeed for your attendance today. We hope that you have learned a lot. I know there's been a lot to digest. But there is a slip in your um, folder where you can order um, copies, transcripts of the um, papers that have been put over today. It will take a little bit of time, but I'm quite sure that uh, it will be profitable to be good for you to get them because it will give you uh, the more detail. One cannot always retain everything that comes to you. But thank you for your attendance. We do appreciate it and we hope to see you all again tomorrow when we have another full and very interesting day. Thank you. Go well on the way home. Ladies and gentlemen, can we start? Is this on? No.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we start, please? The music. The music is rather too long. Uh, I wish to welcome you here today on our second day on consumer power in a free market. We have dynamic speakers and I think from what we have learned yesterday, we shall be graduates today. Because even those who did not know anything about consumerism, I am sure we can tell or speak to other people about it after learning about consumerism yesterday and today. So uh, welcome, feel at ease to ask questions after the speaker has finished. Our first speaker today is Nancy Sayers. Mr. Fred McCaskill is unable to be here this morning as business commitments have taken him overseas. Nancy will take his place. Nancy Sages has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from Yale University in Connecticut, USA, and a Master's degree in Journalism from Columbia University in New York City. <clears throat> she started working in South Africa as a freelancer, a freelancer writer for the Free Market Foundation and has done freelance research for the Lawyers for Human Rights. She now works full time at the Free Market Foundation as a senior researcher and will speak on the topic private service and private services are cheaper. Private services are cheaper. Thank you very much. Up to you, Mrs. Uh, Miss Nancy. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can understand me this morning. I don't speak English, I speak American, but I'll try my best to make myself understandable. Well, I've got some good news for you this morning and some bad news. The good news is that governments all over the world are privatizing their economies and they're saving vast amounts of money. It is so much cheaper to have a private business do a particular service than to have the government do it. And that is why governments, communist, socialist, capitalist, all over the world, are beginning to let the private sector do more. America, Great Britain, Japan, Zaire, Tanzania, China, Germany, even the Soviet Union are just a few of the examples that are beginning to privatize. And of course, we are beginning to privatize here in South Africa, both at the central government level and at the local government level. Let me just give you a few examples of the kinds of savings that governments are achieving by privatizing. In Great Britain, the local government of Kent privatized one service, and that was refu uh, the cleaning of government schools, and it saved over one million pounds a year. The Wandsworth Borough Council, also in Great Britain, privatized refuse collection and saved one million one hundred thirty one million one hundred thirty thousand pounds a year. The World Borough Council privatized just two services, street cleaning and refuse collection, and saved over 1,400,000 pounds. That's more than 7,000 rands in a year. These local governments are doing what economists call contracting out. They're contracting private companies to do what they would normally pay their own employees to do. First, the government will ask private companies to bid for a particular job like school cleaning, uh, street paving, or maintenance of robots. And then companies will offer to do the job at a particular price. And the government will simply choose the one it thinks will do the best job at the lowest price, and then pays it to do that service over a certain period. 
it contracts to an outside company. Over five years, the Wandsworth Borough Council, Council that I mentioned saved over 70 and a half million pounds by contracting out. But it didn't contract out everything. There were certain services that the government continued to do by itself instead of giving it to a private company. But because of the competition from all those other companies bidding for those jobs, the government itself saved money. So before it was spending a certain amount, then after just introducing contracting out, but keeping the job itself, it spent 25% less money on every job that it continued to do. Dr. Madsen Peary, who was a British scholar and is one of the most well-respected authorities on privatization in the world, he studied contracting out in countries all over the world, and he's found that basically it saves about 20 to 40% of the total costs of government. In America, in California, some studies of individual services have shown that for maintaining traffic signals, or robots, it costs the government 56% more than it costs private companies. For road paving, it costs almost twice as much to have a local government do it than to have a private company do it. I'm just going to give you one more example, and it's from this country. It's not of contracting out, but of full privatization, where the government didn't pay a private company to do it, it sold the service completely to a private company, and the company took over. Now, you heard the example briefly yesterday morning from Leon Lowe. It's the example of the Belcom bus service, which, as Leon mentioned, most people consider a failure. It privatized its bus company in 1985, and in 1987, the bus company went bankrupt, and now Belcom no longer has a bus service of its own. Now, again, as Leon said, we look at this as actually a great success. First, the government-run buses in Velcom were losing money every year, even though they were being subsidized by the local taxpayers and the local ratepayers. Part of the money that was collected in local rates and taxes was being used to fund the bus service. So consumers, whether they used the buses or not, were forced to help pay for it. Now, by 1985, the Velcom bus service was losing so much money that each household would have had to contribute over 100 rands a year to keep it going, whether they are pensioners, doctors, families, whatever. Now this illustrates the point that Leon made so well yesterday, that subsidies like this, where the taxpayers pay a certain amount of money to fund a service throughout the area, they harm the poor and they benefit the more wealthy. Because every consumer, every ratepayer and taxpayer was helping to fund the bus service in Welcome widowed pensioners, who perhaps use the bus company very little, were helping to pay for the service for the children of doctors who used it every day. The subsidy actually made it worse for the poor and benefited the rich. And that's exactly the opposite of what it's intended to do. Now, meanwhile, <clears throat> oh, then uh, in 1985, as I said, the private bus company took over, and it no longer got that subsidy from taxpayers. It no longer got money from the rates and local taxes. It had to survive on its own. Only those who used the bus service had to pay for it. Those who rode the bus service paid fares. Now, without that extra money from uh, ratepayers throughout the area, the private company had to either increase its fares or drastically cut its costs. And meanwhile, people, more and more people began to use other forms of transport, like combi taxis, um, lift schemes, and bicycles. And finally, the bus service went bankrupt. Now that there is no more bus service in Velcom, combi taxis and bus lines from other towns have filled its place. And out of all of the people in the area, only three have complained about it. But because the local government is no longer running a bus service, it is saving, again, Leon mentioned, two and a half million rands a year. And the consumers are no longer paying for a bus service that they don't need. Remember that it was the consumers themselves who chose to take combi taxis and chose to ride bicycles. They chose not to pay for the bus service once they had the choice. Once their rates and taxes were no longer funding it and forcing it to be in existence, they simply chose something else. Now, in this case, privatization gave the consumers the power to decide what kind of transport they want. Before the government had that power, through privatization, consumers got the power. Now that, I'm afraid, is the end of my good news this morning. Now for some of the bad. 
governments, local governments in South Africa and governments all over the world are saving money through privatization. But in many cases, what they're doing is using the money they save to spend on other things. They may be becoming very much more efficient in some areas by contracting out, by privatizing, it remaining wasteful in others, and simply pouring that savings into other funds to help keep services that are losing money going. Now, some of them are also finding just other projects to spend on. Now, some of the projects that government may spend on, you may think are worthwhile. You may not, on the face of it, mind if a government privatizes and uses the savings to fund a hospital or to fund social welfare services. But again, there is evidence that even in these very crucial services that we all need, private companies can do them better and for less money. In America, for instance, a private uh, company called Intermountain Healthcare started taking over government hospitals in the late 70s in the state of Utah. And the patients in those hospitals paid 28% less than the national average price of hospital services in the country and they got excellent service. Right now, this year, the University of Colorado in Denver, that hospital is considering privatization, and they project that they'll save $2 million a year, and because of their improved finances, they'll be able to borrow money as well. About $60 million is what they plan to borrow to improve the services. Let me just give you one more example. There are a lot of private companies in America that perform social welfare services. One of them is called Career Works, another is called America Works, and they provide training and job placement for um, the unemployed and for the disadvantaged. Both provide, um, <clears throat> both of them are for-profit firms, so they're not taking taxpayers' money, they're making their own money, so they're saving you and performing a very important service, social welfare. Now when I read about those examples, I think of some of the examples we have in South Africa today. Job creation is one of them. That's a firm that is headed by one of our speakers yesterday, Ian Hetherington, that provides job placement and employment opportunities for those who are disadvantaged. I believe it's a not-for-profit not company, but again, it's a private sector firm that does not force consumers to pay for what it does. It survives by providing good services on its own. The important thing for all of us consumers to remember about all of these examples that I've given you this morning is that private services can save us money, but only if we make sure that it's done right. We have to make sure that it, our government is not spending money in other areas when it privatizes, and that it's privatizing as much as it can to save as much money as possible. Now the question is, which question has come up many times throughout yesterday's conference, is how do we do that? How do we pressure our government to change, especially when so many of us don't even have the vote? Well, there's a good analogy about governments and politicians and any type of leader. And it's that politicians are a lot like surfers on a surfboard. Once they get up on their boards, they can do all sorts of tricks. But unless they follow the wave, they're going to fall off. And we're all the wave. Right now, we've got so many waves going in South Africa. We've got a CP wave going, I'll use my right hand, a CP wave going this way, <laughs> a Mass Democratic Move wave going this way, an Encada wave going this way, a DP wave going this way, and a Nationalist Party wave going this way. It's no wonder that with all these waves going in different directions, we feel like we're just treading water, like we're not moving anywhere. But there is one thing that can get these waves to come together, and that's privatization, and deregulation, as we heard about yesterday, and free markets. Because privatization can save us all money. The more money that we save, the more money that we have in our own pockets from what we earn, the more we decide how our lives are run. Right now, our government collects so much money in taxes and rates and the payments for many other services, and it spends it for us. And so it decides what kind of schooling that we have, what kind of housing that we have, what kind of jobs many of us have, where we can live. It's time that we spent the money that we earned, and we made all those decisions about our lives. Now, <clears throat> privatization, as I said, can give us this decision-making power. After listening to the conference yesterday, I think that 
we have a little bit of a wave going for privatization and free markets here. But the wave is sort of going like this. What we need to do is get our wave going like this. And then we'll be unstoppable. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. I don't know which wave to take. Uh, I can't swim, so if I choose the wrong one, I'm going to sink. Uh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Those who'd like to write them down, you're welcome to do so. Those who'd like to speak on the mic, you're welcome to do so. Uh, thanks heaven, we have somebody who's going to run around like Nancy yesterday. Thank you very much. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the topic is now open for discussion, comments, and questions, particularly. Yes. There's one here. This one goes with the... Oh, that one goes there. <laughs> Um, good morning. I would like to ask, I hear so often about the money that is saved by municipalities and local authorities. Do you have any figures on what is saved in rates and taxes for the individuals? Thank you so much. To be truthful, I don't. It's very hard right now in South Africa to collect figures on actually how much contracting out and how much privatization is going on. <clears throat> but a great deal of it is. If you go to your local government now, chances are, and, and ask them about privatization, they'll say, we're already doing it, we're already contracting out. Now, <clears throat> we would expect then that our rates, of course, would be going down, and our taxes should be going down. But in many cases, they're not. And there are two reasons for that. First is, as I said, in many cases, the government is not actually lowering the rates, it's spending on other things, or using it to fund this other services that may be inefficient. The second reason is our high inflation rate. With prices rising as quickly as they are now, the government is going to use that savings that it makes from any savings that it can get to fund the cost of inflation to itself. So if our rates stay the same, or even if they continue to rise, only not quite as fast as the inflation rate, not, if we're not paying as much in rates as we're increasing in consumer prices all around, then we actually are making the savings. So in the state that we're in now in South Africa, if privatization can keep our local rates the same, or even just slow them down a little, that's an effective savings. But in Great Britain, which is a more stable economy? They've done a lot more about um, actually bringing down rates. And there's actually been some legislation that has enforced the lowering of rates once privatization has taken place. So they've had a little bit more success there. Again, they don't have the same sort of money supply situation that we have. And they've been doing it for much longer as well. Again, it's our responsibility, you know? I mean, we've talked about inflation yesterday and the problems with that and why we have it. And we talked about you know, privatization this morning and where our money goes. If we don't put pressure on the government, then it's going to do what it wants to do, like anyone would. So it seems like everyone else agrees with me on privatization. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Margaret. I just want to find out, uh, the lady has just spoken about uh, privatization and all that, but uh, as a consumer, you haven't clearly explained, especially to me, uh, in which way one can tackle cheaper services as far as uh, privatization is concerned. You just, what I've heard is, uh, you explained about what the government is doing in the United States and uh, what privatization happened in South Africa. But uh, as a consumer, I want to know how does one tackle it and uh, what should one look for and what are ways that one can go through in, as far as uh, privatization is concerned or, or cheaper services are concerned. Well, what consumers can do is part of this wave theory that I talked about. And then again, we've had to get this wave going that we've talked about. I think what consumers can do best is, first of all, be as informed as they can about privatization. And you can go to, you can 
people, for white people, they can go to their local areas and go to their local governments and find out what's going on. I don't think black people are too willing to go to their local authorities for anything. But, um, and when you understand about privatization, and when you know what's going on, then the more people you tell, the bigger the wave gets. If we start at sort of the grassroots level with consumers, and consumers make themselves aware, then they perhaps tell their business community, who then will perhaps tell their local leaders, established leaders in Soweto, uh, local authorities, um, members of parliament, anyone who is a representative of your community. If we work up from there, they'll be pushing up further on their leaders. But that's, that all depends on us. It depends on how much pressure we put on our leaders, we put on our local communities, and how much we push them to get the message up to the top. Right, that, right now, we've got a top-down government that decides what it's going to do, and it lets us know. We should switch that around to it's a bottom-up government, to where we tell them what we want, and we force them to, to listen to us simply by increasing our numbers. Thank you. And then... Uh, and then that gentleman in the back. My name is Paul from the Consumer Council of Petersburg. I've got two questions. Number one, uh, you mentioned that the consumer has got to be informed. My question is, whose responsibility is it, is it to make sure that the consumer is informed? Now, secondly, you mentioned something on contracting out. My question is, is it always the case that the government takes the, or gives the service to the company that can do the job best at a lower price? Okay, I'll start with the first question. Whose responsibility is it that the consumer is um, informed? That's the consumer's responsibility. As we've learned over the years, no one is going to take care of us. I mean, if you trust your government to take care of you, you may find that it's not quite doing what you intended to do. It's every individual's responsibility, responsibility to be as informed as possible as he or she can. I mean, coming to this conference was a good way to be informed. There's lots of reading that can be done. There's lots of foundations and universities that can give you information. And there's lots of local meetings and things going on that you can raise points and ask them about privatization. Your politicians and your leaders know about these things. They just don't get people asking them about it. And that's our responsibility. So it's every individual here, it's all of our jobs to make sure that we are informed. The second question was contracting out. And is it always the case that governments pick the best company, the one that will do the job for the lowest price and do the best job? No, it's not always the case. There's a law in New York City that mandates that you must pick the company that gives the lowest price. Now, often they'll just get fly-by-night companies or ones that aren't very good that simply do a very bad job and we lose even more money. And then they blame it on privatization, saying the private company came in and it was a failure. Now, whether it's a government company or a private company, there are good and bad businessmen and women. It's the job of the government, when it's going to privatize, if it wants to save money, is to, do, is to find out what is going to do the best job at the lowest price. Like in that lot in New York that's supposed to give us all this money saved is not helping us at all. So it's not always the case that contracting out goes to the company that's going to do the best job. Sometimes it just goes to the one that looks like the cheapest, but it's actually going to be much more expensive in the long run. I wonder if I can ask a question from the... To, uh, pose, pose a question to the speaker. Uh, there was an article in Business Day about a month ago by an economist at Pitts whose uh, name eludes me for the moment, and he argued that uh, privatization has three main three main functions, one of which is to raise money for uh, for the government by selling off state-owned industries. Uh, I can't quite see that raising money for the government is, is, uh, is, a, is a good objective of privatization in the context of the organizers and supporters of this conference. A second reason for privatization that that economist raised was that it, uh, it changes, if a state firm is privatized, it changes the incentives of the managers. They've got to meet the consumers requirements by keeping prices at the level that consumers are prepared to pay uh, because if they don't lower the prices then they'll go out of business. A state-owned uh, firm's managers uh, can, can, can stay in business for, until, he, until he's 60, 65 and then he gets a golden handshake from the government anyway plus free golden tickets on uh, South African Airways and South, South African Railways and the like. And a third reason for privatization is that it should spread wealth and uh, income uh, throughout, the, throughout, throughout the economy. Um, now if we sell off uh, state-owned industries to the to the population, 
Um, obviously, the people that are going to buy them are the San Lams and the Anglo-Americans of this world. This is hardly going to uh, result in a, in a spread of ownership of, of shares and of wealth and of income in this country. Uh, and the, that economist argued that, in fact, instead of trying to uh, raise money by raise money for the government in Pretoria by selling off industries, we should give the industries back. Uh, to the people of South Africa simply by issuing share certificates or mutual fund certificates or unit trust certificates to the individual residents of the country, free of charge, because that's what the, the industries belong to anyway. That would achieve the, the objective of, of putting these uh, organizations into the private sector. The managers would have to meet consumers' uh, consumers' desires or they would go bust, and new managers would replace them who would set prices and produce the products the consumers wanted. Um, and so you didn't uh, address that issue of uh, what, what do we do with SETs and the ports and the SAA and the like. Would you, would you care to comment on that, uh, on, the, on that Economist article, which may or may not have been read by some of the, 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 the members of this audience this morning? Yes, that Economist's name escapes me as well. Um, <clears throat> yes, I would like to comment on, first of all, the three objectives of privatization. And uh, Professor Rieke mentioned that the free market, the supporters of the free market may disagree with the idea of raising money for the government through privatization. And as I explained, governments often just spend the money that they save. If the government is going to use that money to reduce the debt that we have, which is growing every year, that in effect will save us money. And that's fine. I'm all for the government cleaning up its house and using the savings on privatization to reduce what it owes outside in the world. Because again, that's going to benefit us later, the taxes that it will reduce. So if the government is going to use the money to reduce our debt, then, it's, then I think it's all right. Um, the second um, objective was that privatization makes companies more efficient. I agree with that wholeheartedly. That, again, private managers, because they have competition and because they have the constraints of having to make profits, forces them to be more efficient where the government has no such constraints. If it doesn't make a profit, it taxes If the government doesn't, doesn't have enough money to spend what it needs to spend, it prints money. They don't have those constraints. So yes, privatization will make uh, companies more efficient. The third one is about spreading the wealth through privatization. And this is a very sort of tough question. There are a lot of, a lot of different issues involved. For me, the overall objective of privatization and of economic change is giving people more money that they make in their pockets. Because that gives them the greatest power over their lives. And the idea of selling shares to everyone, giving shares to everyone, I think is a very good idea. But I personally would prefer to have an extra chunk of my salary not being taken out of taxes than being given a share. Many people out here may be very interested in holding shares in Anglo-American um, stats or in ESCOM. I personally am not. I'd rather have pocket money that I'll spend on something else. That's the choice that people make. I think selling shares or giving shares to the people is a good idea, but if it's not going to make the company more efficient, if it's not going to make the company run for less money and save us overall, then I think we ought to think again. For me, the overall objective of privatization is lowering the cost to the consumer. If the way to privatize through selling shares to the people does that, great. And it gives people all sorts of stakes in these companies, which I think is a great idea if that's what they want. But if it doesn't, then I think we should look for, this, look for the solution that makes the company the most efficient. And that raises that point then, what happens if the most efficient way to get to privatize ESCOM is to sell it to an um, Anglo-American or a big private company, a big, what we consider to be a, no a monopoly. Well, I would refer back to uh, Professor Leach's speech yesterday about monopolies that are caused by government legislation, which simply disbars competition where you're not allowed to compete, and ESCOM is one of those. Or monopolies that come simply because they're the best. If we had what's called freedom of entry, a free market to where anyone was allowed to compete try to compete in any market that they could, then we would have no monopoly problem. Because the only way for monopolies would the only way for monopolies to survive would be by being the most efficient and giving the consumers what they want. Now think about it, if you're a company that's very large, you have a huge share of the market, and <clears throat> there aren't many competitors, just think of the reward it would be for someone to come up with another idea, another way of doing that business that's better. The threat of competition is so strong on free market companies, especially big companies, because they have, they're, they're doing well. Someone who can, can do it better can really make a lot of money. So the threat of competition is very strong. What I would say about the whole monopoly question and privatization is to free up the market and allow people to compete. And your monopoly problem will, in effect, disappear.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid uh, our time is getting shorter and shorter. I have two speakers there and one right at the back and that will be all, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mildred is my name. I'm a hospital social worker. I'd like to know what are the advantages or disadvantages of privatizing black hospitals with special reference to pensioners. I think there are no disadvantages. I think there are only advantages. Right now, there are so, people have black people especially have so little freedom to bring up to start their own medical care, to start hospitals that they're they're in great demand. Hospitals are overcrowded, and of course, people are trying to get into white hospitals now, which to try and solve this problem. If we privatized hospitals, think how many clinics, smaller clinics, would arise in Soweto. Think how many bigger hospitals would come up that perhaps between Soweto and Johannesburg, Baraguanas could have, would have competition for it much more, so there'd be more hospitals available. And that competition for those hospitals would force down the prices and it would improve the care that's being given. As far as pensioners concern, are concerned, again, I think that would help them as well. That's a, I'm not as familiar with the issue of what to do with pensions, but let me give my best answer at this point. Again, the idea of competition and more hospitals people with freedom to set up hospitals and clinics wherever they want. These hospitals would have to compete to give the best deal to people. The people with the most experience um, in medical care, who've been in medical care the longest, are, are today's pensioners who work in hospitals. And they are going to be prized employees. If all different hospitals are competing for them now, they're going to have to entice them to come to that hospital through a good pension system. And I think in that respect, it could improve the situation. Munro National Council of Women. Uh, my question was going to be whether you would make very clear the difference between privatization and pseudo-privatization, which seems to be a course on which the uh, government thought is tending. But in the time that I've been sitting here, a member of your panel and you have given a very good entree into this. I don't know whether you could make the situation clearer. Because I think from the point of view of consumers, we are very much in a dangerous position of being fogged off with what I can only call pseudo-privatization. Yes, I'll try to clarify it. I'll be brief. What I would call pseudo-privatization is privatization without deregulation. Now, they did that in Great Britain with their phone company. They privatized it and they didn't allow competition for it. They did create one company to compete with their phone company, so now there are two. But no one else is allowed to. There's still a law against competition for the phone company. Now, I don't see where that really helps the situation. It has made some savings, and phone companies are improving in Britain. But what they really need is everyone freedom to compete. In South Africa, if we privatize and keep so many of the laws that, that help big business, either statutory laws that help monopolies, or some of the other types of laws that one of the speakers mentioned yesterday that protect businesses indirectly. Unless we repeal those as well as we privatize, we'll get a slight benefit, but we're still going to end up with that situation of real pseudo-freedom, pseudo pseudo-privatization. So it's privatized and deregulated. Thank you. There was uh, a gentleman at the back there. I think it's From the floor, that would be the last person to ask a question. I don't know whether you can Thank you, Madam Chair. Mine is not going to be a question as such, but a point which I would like the audience to share with me. We have said great things about the free market approach to economics, which we all, including myself, are hoping for. But everything that can be done to address the grievances the concerns of consumers in this country in particular rests on one thing only, where the citizens all enjoy freedom of choice. Unfortunately, as we sit here very nicely mixed, we suffer from the cancer of separation. We have in our society those who are able to make the choices and those who, because of historical events, 
are unable to influence the corridors of power. So at the end of the day, the situation remains the same until the society is really free. Late yesterday, one of the speakers mentioned that those of us who enjoy the privilege of the vote will be facing with the coming election the choice of making a quantum leap to decide for this country and its future once and for all which direction we have to go. That is their sacred responsibility and in parting all I want to say is it depends on those who have the vote to decide whether consumers are going to have their concerns corrected, to decide whether we are in fact going to live together as brothers or perish together like fools. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we have 10 minutes for questions. I have taken, I've given you 15 minutes and I'm afraid we cannot add another minute. We have two questions here unanswered. I hope during um, perhaps the second or third speaker, these questions can come up again. At the moment, the first speaker and the questions from the floor is closed. I'm sorry about it, but time, ladies and gentlemen. I'll answer any more questions at tea time as well, if you want to speak to me. Uh, may I introduce the second speaker, Professor Duncan Rickey. Professor Duncan Rickey is E.P. Bradlow Professor, Head of the Department of Business Economics and Dean of Commerce at Vets University. He was educated in Scotland and has lectured in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Asia, the USA, and Europe. In 1988, he received the Distinguished Teachers Award from Vets. He has written several books on economics and industry and has consulted firms in banking, pharmaceuticals, advertising, and marketing and market research. He will speak on the topic self-reliance in South Africa health care. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairman, is that coming through? The bad news is, <coughs> like the previous speaker, I, I don't speak English. Uh, I speak Scottish. Uh, the other piece of bad news is that I want to refer or to draw on uh, an academic article which myself and a colleague uh, contributed to the South African Journal of Medicine uh, last September. The good news is that I'm going to try to make it as uh, as simple and as non-technical and, and as comprehensible as I possibly can. The topic I want to speak on is much less ambitious than the, than the previous uh, speakers. I want to talk about self-reliance in healthcare and in particular in South Africa. We have in South Africa, and in fact it's not unique to this country, we have throughout the world, um, in, every, in every country that I know of, a healthcare cost explosion. Costs are rising, how do we contain them? How can we cope with providing uh, adequate healthcare for our population? Given that healthcare costs are rising at an extremely rapid rate, and in most countries, including South Africa, rising more rapidly than our gross national product. And I want to argue that one route, and I'm only speaking about one route, one route is the role of self-medication, the use of proprietary medicines and over-the-counter medicines, the sort of thing that you can buy from pick and pay, checkers, and or your local pharmacy. Can self-medication help to lower costs? 
And ostensibly, of course, the answer is yes, uh, because OTC, over-the-counter medicines, OTC medicines don't need the large-scale infrastructure that much of other medical care does, such as doctors, hospitals, clinics, uh, nurses, and often they don't even need the role of the pharmacist. Uh, the question is, okay, these medicines do, uh, can be obtained from the, uh, the, the local trading store, the pharmacy, or the supermarket. The question is, do these medicines work effectively? Do they work safely? They're certainly relatively inexpensive. Um, can I just uh, refer to two quotations, two quotations by a well-known health economist who used to come from the University of Exeter in England and who's now in the University of Otago in New Zealand. One of his quotations from a journal article that he wrote in the uh, early 1970s in the Journal of Social and Economic Administration is that self-medication, he says, is extremely cost-effective. A few pens, he was obviously referring to the UK at the time, a few pens will remove a headache, allowing a person to continue his normal business. And he went on to say that one day saved per worker, this was the UK, one day saved per worker in industry per annum would equal the total amount spent on over-the-counter medicine. Now, I haven't got the data for South Africa or other countries, but I suspect that that information is very, very similar uh, in other countries in, in the world, including this one. A number of studies have been done, before I uh, show you what's occurred in South Africa, a number of studies have been done on self-medication um, in the United Kingdom in the 1960s and the 1970s, which Professor Cooper of New Zealand uh, carried out. More recently, in the USA, a study was carried out in 1985. Uh, Ms. Sudashenoi may know of the, the study that was carried out in Australia in the 1980s, and the one I want to report on today is the RSA study which I carried out with a colleague, Don Scott, in BITS, in the Business Economics Department, in 1986. The study in the UK came to the conclusion that, in fact, Brits are pretty unhealthy. 95% um, of the population in Britain suffered a symptom in the previous 14 days, the 14 days prior to the, to the survey that was carried out. And the, the uh, diseases that were reported on were mainly headaches, worry, tummy troubles, coughs, colds, sore throats, backaches. And the conclusion of the British study, this is quite a while ago, the British study, was that these are ailments which were regarded by doctors as most suitable for treatment by home medication or self-medication. And these quotations and the results come from a, a Royal College of General Practitioners journal, the GRCGP, in 1976 by two physicians, Morell and Whale. Let me just give you a, a brief insight into what we did in South Africa and what the more recent studies have, have tried to do before I zero in on our local one. The three recent studies are America, Australia, and South Africa. Um, and I like to think the South Africa one is, uh, is pretty definitive, and here are several reasons why. Um, the sample in the States was 1,500 American people who were male for opinions and, and uh, histories of their actions. In Australia, they looked at 340 people by interview, and in South Africa, we, in this country, looked at uh, or surveyed 3,000 people of all racial groups. The only grouping in the country that we did not look at were the rural black community. Um, the symptoms that we asked people to report on uh, came to a total of 46, in Australia it was 47, and the Americans had 428 different symptoms. I'm not quite sure how they managed to get that. Um, <laughs> The Australian study was restricted to uh, the urban area, which even Ms. Shenai uh, does not belong to, I don't think. Um, we looked at the whole South African community, uh, except, as I say, for the rural blacks. All studies broke down their results demographically. South Africa, of course, is unique, as we've been reminded this morning. We uh, broke down the study by ethnicity as well. and. Um, we tried to evaluate the effectiveness of the treatment medically. And in America, they only asked the respondent. In Australia and South Africa, we asked both the respondent and a panel of physicians what they thought of what had been done. <coughs> now, the basic aims of the South African study were, first of all, to find out what the healthcare profile of South Africans was, um, and secondly, to find out if, once they were ill, did they use over-the-counter medicines, home medicines, and did they do so responsibly? So here we're here, uh, and I'll refer back and forth to this, this acetate uh, in the next 10 minutes or so. 
the first question we asked was, okay, what ailments do South Africans have all drippings? Uh, I hate that word, it's become politically emotive, but you know what I mean. Um, what ailments do South Africans suffer from? And we broke that down in our sample of 3,000 by the frequency of suffering, uh, demographic factors, age factors, sex factors, the type of people they are, their alcohol consumption, their fitness patterns, their activities, do they smoke, and, uh, and what have you. And the questions that we asked them, uh, and we, we, we showed them a, a flashcard to try to find out what they suffered from, and I'll just flash this very, very quickly uh, at you. We asked them about 46 different ailments, and we said, look, did you suffer from any of these in the last month? And the, we emphasized that we did not want information on uh, chronic ailments. We were not interested in sufferers in, uh, from cancer and TB and, uh, and the like. We were, we were interested in short-term acute illnesses, acute ailments only. And the sort of things we looked at are highlighted here, ranging from headaches to sore throats, down to diarrhea to vomiting, to indigestion pains, to palpitations of the heart, to rashes or itches. Um, right the way through uh, to discharge in the ear, to feeling depressed, feeling irritable, swollen ankles. Uh, our 47th healthcare classification was none. The Australians, I'm not quite sure what their 47th was. And we asked people in South Africa, did you suffer from any of these ailments, one or more, in the last, in the last, uh, in the last month? And our conclusions, we found that in fact, Males and females complained in the last month as follows. Now, if you just look at the bottom line, which is the one that really matters, in the previous month, 54% of males suffered from at least one of these ailments, and 66% of women suffered from at least one of these ailments. In other words, we men are tougher. And uh, there, there, are diff there are differences by racial group, but again, uh, <laughs> if you compare females with males, Irrespective of racial group, you'll find that we males uh, do uh, seem to uh, complain less, but we die more quickly, as you all know. Uh, well, what did we suffer from? And the proportion of ailments that we got were as follows. 30.3% of us had headaches. 14 plus 12 plus 4, that's about 20, that's about 30. 30% of us had things like cold, sore throats. Okay, I will do. 14% of us had colds, 30% had sore throats, 4% of us had coughs, and then there was a few other odds and ends like backache, stomach pain, pains in the eye, and other, other ailments. So in fact, of the 47 ailments, most of us suffered from these, and 40% of us didn't suffer at all on average in the month in, the month in question. Now, second question we asked was, what do they do about it? Do they go to the doctor? Do they self-medicate? Um, do, do, they, do they get uh, their self-medication from the chemist or the supermarket or whatever? What do they do? And we found what they did. 30% of us, this is people who, su who suffered, 30% of us did nothing. 1% of us used a prescription medicine already in the home, and 29% of us went to the doctor or some other place and got a new prescription medicine. But 37% either used an OTC medicine that was in the home, or we obtained a new home medicine. And 3% of us had some sort of homemade remedy that we had, like having a hot mustard food bath or something of that sort. But the, but the big thing here is that 37% of us did use a home medication. So what did we do about it? Next question, of course, is now that we know that home medication, self-medication, informal medication, if you like, um, is, is common, is what we did effective? And here is how we perceived, we as consumers perceived the effectiveness of what we did. <coughs> and if you just look with me at the main diseases, headaches, colds, sore throats, cough, backache, stomach pain, pain in the eye, and restrict yourself to this column, the average, forget about the races, 87% of us thought the headache cures were effective, 85 thought the cold cures were effective, 81 the sore throat cures were effective, nearly 80% thought the cough cures were effective, 70% thought the back cures, 81% thought the stomach pain cures were effective, and the least effective was 65% said the pain in the eye cure was effective. So by and large, what I'm saying is, what we did, we proceed as consumers um, what to be effective. But of course, we're only consumers, there are people out there that know far better than us 
and the doctors and nurses and the pharmacists. And I asked the fourth question, do doctors approve of the ailments that we chose as consumers um, to be self-medicated? Do the experts, whatever that might mean, do the experts think that we did the right thing? And we asked the panel of doctors what their views were uh, on the activities we took. And doctors' opinions relating to these ailments were as follows. For headaches, doctors said, self-treat with an OTC or suffer, do nothing. Cold and flu, self-treat with an OTC or do nothing. Sore throats, their first choice, they said, do nothing or then try an OTC. Cough car, self cough and cold, catar, self-treat with an OTC or do nothing. Backache, self-treat with an OTC or do nothing, the doctor said, or if it's severe, then come to us. Stomach pain, they disagreed with the consumers, visit a doctor or do nothing. Pain in the eye, definitely visit a doctor. Now the point there is that not only did we as consumers think what we did was effective, but by and large the medical profession, who are not um, uh, normally renowned for believing that we're responsible people, <laughs> tended to agree with what we did. Uh, do doctors approve of the ailment? They, and then I asked the question, well, okay, doctors approve of the ailments we selected to self-treat, but what products did people select? And we found out what products people selected by brand, etc. And we then went back to the doctors and said, okay, this is commercial information, by the way, so I can't give you that. Now that we know what people used, now that we know what people used, we went back to the doctors and we said, okay, do doctors approve of the actual product the patient selected? They did approve of the ailment for self-treatment. For self did they approve of our choice of, um, of drug or of medication? And here was the answer there. The doctors said that what we chose for headaches, 92% of doctors said it's suitable. What we, choose, what we chose for colds, 70% of doctors said it was good and right. What we did for sore throats, three quarters of doctors said it was fine. The only one where doctors disagreed with patients was stomach pain. That really threw me there because everything else the doctors said we did the right thing. Until we looked at the actual uh, stomach pain treatment that we chose, and when I look back at the raw data, this could not be computerized, uh, because the, the medications that we chose as, as consumers included for stomach pain things like uh, stony and aspirin. Uh, we, uh, we agonized over what the heck stony and aspirin was for quite a while until we realized it was stony ginger beer and aspirin um, <laughs> combined. So maybe the doctors were right. And the final question is, okay, having got all of this, does this suggest that there's a market out there for self-medication? Is there a role for responsible self-medication? And do consumers use self-medication responsibly? And let me just give my conclusions because I got my 10 minutes left about 12 minutes ago, I think. And the conclusions were, self-medication is very cost-effective. Self-medication is very inexpensive. Self-medication, self-care, relieves pressures on expensive alternatives such as hospitals, doctors, and prescriptions. That's especially valuable in rural, but as we all know, it's also valuable in urban areas. Consumers' ailments are common. Most of us suffer something fairly frequently. Doctors tell us that we're responsible in what we choose for a treatment, and we ourselves say that the chosen treatment works. Now, this obviously suggests that there is a role for expansion of self-care in health provision. Now why might there not be more of an expansion of this uh, particular, particularly economically and healthily beneficial industry? What are the barriers to expansion? One of the barriers to expansion, of course, is regulation. There are scheduled medicines which can only be obtained, which can only be obtained either through a pharmacist, and there are even more scheduled medicines which can only be obtained through a doctor. And for example, things like high percent cortisone, ibuprofen, loperamide. Until very recently, these could only be obtained through, through a doctor with a prescription. In recent years, these have been actually descheduled in South Africa, descheduled in many other countries in the world, and can now be obtained through a pharmacy or through, um, or through a, a supermarket or, or, not, or a store without a pharmacy. Descheduling would provide us with more choice. Other countries like uh, New Zealand and Australia, or certain states in Australia, have also descheduled nitrazepam and diazepam, which are available in pharmacies. <coughs> so these are often no longer prescription-only drugs, and they've become either pharmacy-only drugs, or you can get them over the counter in trading stores and supermarkets. So possibly we should get more descheduling down from the doctor level to the pharmacy level. And we can go further and say restraints on what pharmacists can sell without prescription could be relaxed, 
And furthermore, because we've dealt with a lot of uh, medicines that have been sold through trading stores, supermarkets and the like, descheduling further down could, could be continued and restraints on what retailers sell without the benefit of a pharmacist can be relaxed. They work. We use them responsibly. Do we need government? And in fact, Pretoria for once, actually in the Brown Commission, which came out about two years ago, recommended precisely these things. What has the government done about it? Nothing at all. Where did I say all of this? Uh, this was said in the South African Medical Journal in 1988, September. Anyone who'd like a full copy of the paper, it's, they're, they're welcome to have it. Uh, it was apparently fairly contentious. It's one of the few papers that, uh, that stimulated a leader, a large-scale leader in the South African Medical Journal to accompany this particular piece of research. And the leader was written by Professor Cole of UCT Department of Pharmacology. And uh, I'm happy to say that despite the fact the editors of the journal uh, had to call on uh, a, a, a clinician to criticize and appraise our paper, that the leader could, also, could but come out and agree with our results. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ricky. Some of the points we raised it's on. Uh, some of the points we have raised um, are very interesting. Some doctors say we take too long to get to the, the, the professional doctors for medicine. So perhaps during question time, one, some people will ask you that. And the other thing is that uh, I don't know how uh, my black fellow countrymen think about this uh, discussion, because uh, it is going to encourage uh, our using our own um, witchcraft medicine, which are sometimes very dangerous. Anyway, I leave it to the audience here. Yeah? Uh, perhaps I should put one word it's time we go back to use Serokolo. Uh, first question. Thank you very much. My name is Margaret Lessing, and I'm speaking as a member of that Brown Commission of Inquiry. I would just like to ask the speaker why they didn't think it necessary to ask every one of those people they questioned if they belonged to a medical aid society. I do so because it was our... Uh, experience that many people are using medical aid societies when they could be using self-medication, which is putting up to a considerable extent the cost of many medicines. The, the answer is that in the, 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 the main study, which I could not go into in detail, is that we did ask about membership of medical aid societies. Um, one of the reasons here being that we were wanting to try to encourage uh, usage of uh, um, not, we were not trying to encourage, we were trying to find out if they, if they did belong to medical aid societies. The results then we, we released to the medical aid schemes and one of our recommendations was that uh, deregulation of medical aid schemes sh should occur. Um, at that stage, basically, most medical aid schemes in South Africa had uh, what we called first rand cover. In, 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 in other words, immediately you were ill, uh, you could claim against your medical aid uh, for the first rand of expenditure, uh, and if you can claim for the first round of expenditure as a medical aid scheme member, uh, therefore your, your medicine is free at the point of consumption, um, and therefore why go and, and, and self-medicate it? It, 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 it? it would be an irrational consumer choice. Um, so we've argued very strongly that medical aid schemes be permitted to, be, to, to compete by product and different uh, level of coverage, so those consumers who do not want to pay the point of consumption and therefore pay higher premium, to the medical aid schemes can do so, and those people who want to pay lower premium through the medical aid scheme and can have a variety of levels of coverage, types of coverage, can also do so. In other words, one of the conclusions of our study was that medical aid schemes should be deregulated and permitted to provide different levels of coverage, the same as we can obtain as household owners for household coverage, as car drivers for car coverage, and the like. Those were the Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. I, I did make input into the Brown Commission report. Morning, and 
Shane, thank you very much. I'd like to ask how you believe, uh, Professor Riki, if you could perhaps answer this, uh, how has the OCT been motivated by the consumer uh, to, or how has the consumer been encouraged to purchase his um, products over the counter at his pharmacy? Is that because you feel there has been a lot of um, <coughs> assistance by the manufacturers of the pharmaceutical products and various pharmaceutical groups in the media? Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to answer the question <laughs> as you'd like me to, or, or if, I fully interpret, but if I'm interpreting it correctly. Obviously, uh, proprietary medicines are the same as any other good, and the, the main method of consumer education and the main method of imparting knowledge to the consumer um, two main methods are through the, you know, the, the true power of advertising itself, which is a, a cheap method of mass communication and of education, um, and through the retailer, actually face-to-face, -face, in face-to-face -face discussions with the, with, the, with the consumer. The retailer, in turn, depends upon uh, consumer feedback on uh, the success of the product he sells, that applies to, um, to sugar as well as to, to, to medications, and the retailer, in turn, also depends upon the, the manufacturer's uh, salesman telling him uh, what the, 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 the merits and demerits of the product are. So the, 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 the whole marketing channel, the manufacturer, the retailer, and feedback from fellow consumers is important in the choice by any one individual consumer. Uh, all I've tried to show this morning is that given all of that information, that consumers act responsibly and rationally and uh, this, this applies across all groupings, ages, and sexes in the country. Um, and these studies, uh, the study I've done this morning, shown you this morning, provides results which are very, very similar to the results we got in Australia, the UK, and the US, that consumers are not the fools that bureaucrats sometimes make them out to be. Thank you very much. That gentleman at the back, and then you. Thank you. My name is David Mushaparu. Uh, I'd like to ask this question. Uh, did you, in your deliberations with your learned friends, discuss African strong traditional medicines? Because most of our people use them. And, you know, in the minds of many people, they are discredited, our uh, witch doctors are a discredited lot. So, what's your view about those people and their med medical uh, that practices as such, because most of people consult them for whatever ailments that we are doing. Because, say, take for instance, uh, in our uh, community, the older people still use them a lot. What is your view? Thank you. Um, the, the answer to that is partly statistical. Uh, one of the slides that I, that I showed you showed that 3% of the population used what I termed on the slide, other, because it's a small group, 3% of the population, or 3.3% of the complainants, use other types of medicine. I refer jocularly to the mustard, to the food bath with mustard in it. Uh, I don't know what these other, um, what these other therapies were. I presume they would include traditional uh, tribal, tribal medication. Um, but bear in mind what I did say, that there was one part of South African society that we did not survey, and that, that was the, the rural community, the rural black community. We surveyed the rural white, rural Indian color. I, I have no view on the, um, as an economist, I have no confidence to express a view on the uh, effectiveness of the medications. I can tell you what people said about their effectiveness. The stony and ginger one was obviously regarded by doctors as ineffective. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, it's me, Whitley Lever Brothers. I work on um, a, a black educational program for our company, and the one thing that comes out very, very clearly is that one can't actually make a clear distinction between an urban situation and a rural situation, because in an urban situation, you actually do find vast numbers of the community who have very limited uh, liter uh, literacy levels. And what concerns me about over-the-counter medicines is that if you uh, uh, read the, the papers that come with many of these medicines, you find that if they are actually misused, they can be very dangerous. And I think that before we move in this direction, 
there must be some responsibility placed at the door of the manufacturers of these products to make sure that the instructions are made or produced in a way which are understandable to people who can't read. And I would suggest that they go for a more visual type of instruction <coughs> pamphlet which goes into the medicines. Because certainly in our um, uh, interaction with that people, both in urban and in rural situations, people who need um, input as far as basic living skills are concerned, there is a very great danger about the misuse of all sorts of products and I speak here about even detergent and, and household cleaning products, which are everyday um, household commodities which, which they, they encounter. And I think that um, that is a point that must be taken cognizance of before there is any great move towards self-medication. Thank you. I think that the, answer to, the answer to that one, of course, is that the data show unambiguously that the products are used appropriately. Um, and that if one manufacturer is constructing package inserts and designing package inserts inappropriately for his market, then he will suffer uh, um, loss of market share because the products will be perceived or will not be just be perceived as products will not be effective. Um, the industry as a whole, I'm not talking about individual companies, the industry as a whole seems to be doing so effectively. Individual companies no doubt will pay the price if they don't design them effectively. But I'd hate to uh, pontificate as, an, as a a paternalist and say that the patients out there are behaving irresponsibly uh, because I've got no data to, to even start to suggest that. The difference between the urban and the rural blacks, which uh, you, 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 you mentioned, I think you'll understand if you work for Levers that uh, the MRA Omnijet surveys um, are just not carried out in the rural black areas and that if, if Lever Brothers care to give us another uh, 30 or 40,000 rand, we will we'll, um, flood that hole. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Laura Cott, National Council of Women. I would like to know if when you did the survey, you took income into consideration because with the rising costs of medical consultations, that must have played quite a big part. Yes, I did. Uh, my colleague and I did. Uh, the answer was there, was there were no significant differences between the results I showed you uh, by ethnic group, uh, by region, by age, um, or, by, or, by, or by income bracket. The most interesting, uh, the most statistically significant difference was that um, young people complained more than old. Uh, maybe they have different standards. I don't know. Maybe their parents are more stoical. Uh, but certainly, and again, that is that is a factor that seems to have been true across countries, that the, that the youth complain more than the, than the elderly, uh, which is the opposite of what one would expect, because one would expect the youth, i.e. the 15 to 25-year-olds, to be healthier. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Duncan Ricky. Is that working? Oh, then I'll use this one. I'm afraid we cannot uh, take another question because of pressure of time. Our next speaker is Mr. Michael Cork. Uh, he knows a little bit of Zulu and Sudo. It's time I introduced him in, that, in those languages. Anyway, for the benefit of my friends here, we shall do it in English. Michael Cork became headmaster of St. Barnabas College in 1970 where he has taught English and Divinity in Standard 5 through to Standard 10 and public, publicly promoted the principle of non-racial education in South African schools, particularly Anglican schools who hung on to a separate education for so long. He has a BA Honours degree from Wits University, a diploma with distinction from the Johannesburg College of Education. He has vast teaching experience and church-related work. He has won several awards, including the Transvaal Teachers Association Award for Teaching Ability. He will speak on the topic, Education for a Free Society. Thank you very much.
comrade Che. Is it bust? How's that? It's on. It's bust. Yeah. Perhaps I can use my voice. <coughs> Hello. There we go. when they do get there. What reasonable person can be surprised 
at the student uprising against the perversions of education with which they have been fed. How are we to intervene in the vicious cycle of poverty, ignorance, unemployment, and hopelessness which possess, besets the lost generations who have missed out on any schooling process and the kids at present at school working or doing nothing much in overcrowded and demoralizing conditions? And white people are just as much the victims of CNO as black people. The privileged may have had access to the learning opportunities which give access to the professional and business world, but in the process they have been denied the, in, in, the, um, the, the but in the process they have been denied the enriching experiences of interaction with the oppressed and the cut and fr thrust of fair competition, which is the very stuff of the free market. Certainly, government-controlled education has been bad for all the people of South Africa. This failure is manifested in the present arrangements relating to public education at primary and secondary levels, where schools are controlled by some 17 state departments falling under the three tricameral departments of education and culture, the DET, and the various Bantustan authorities. All these departments are based on the principle of racial and ethnic exclusivity and are consequently unacceptable to the majority of the people that they are supposed to serve. It is therefore not surprising that they are complemented by a growing and variegated independent sector consisting of the traditional private school grouping, of those under the Independent Schools Council formed in the APS, largely middle class and affluent in nature, Another grouping of younger, less affluent and more varied independent schools, members of the non-racial Southern African Association of Independent Schools, an assortment of street academies and study centres, many of which are professionally of dubious value, a remnant of the old mission schools, and other alternative ventures in settlements of the homeless, on farms and in the Bantu stones. There are also those children who have no access to education of any kind, who sit outside the school system, and to whom DET kids seem indeed privileged. The second question, should education be controlled by a central body or agency, or should it be controlled by parents? This poses the question regarding the political objectives of education. Within South Africa, apartheid ideologues have worked to maintain control of the schools so as to attempt to determine exactly how and what children and young adults learn. But for them, it has become a losing battle. ASAP, that is, Pressure Group All Schools for All People, has recently spelled out a simple manifesto for short-term change, more specifically as it affects white state schools threatened with closure on account of declining white numbers in inner city areas. The ASAP argument recognizes education as a basic human right that should be free and compulsory to all children, in schools open to all children regardless of their race classification, employing teachers regardless of their race classifications, and situated close to the homes of the children. The manifesto also knows so specifically rejects the use of school buildings for purposes other than education. But alleviating the kind of problem being addressed by ASAP in Johannesburg and similar groupings elsewhere only touches on the problem of making this basic human right, opening the doors of learning, available to all South Africa's children. To dwell too long on what is essentially a problem of the middle class and the rising middle class is to risk forgetting the needs of the great multitude of educationally oppressed. These are the successive cohorts of illiterate people who since 1976 have been caught up in the turmoil of the townships and the dislocation of DET schools. The children who today are subjected to the daily round of inactivity in DET schools where nothing is happening. The urban refugees and their rural cousins in densely packed Bontestown schools without access to books or writing material or personal space or much faith in the educational process. Herbert Villacazzi, at that time on the staff of the University of Cape Town, 
writing on the subject of people's education, offers a glimpse of how privatization might be turned to the advantage of the greatest number of the population. And I quote from Villacazi, he says, oppressed people, as members of their respective communities, must control schools and education in their communities the way major shareholders control their corporations. It is in this sense above all that the concepts of people's education and community control of schools should be understood. It is first and foremost a question of power. The power to hire and dismiss experts, the power to look for and utilize talents to meet your needs. I continue with Villacazi. The state should have minimum control over education. Its involvement should be limited to providing funds for the construction of schools, equipment, maintenance books, salaries and staff, and making a few other very general guidelines and principles formulated and agreed to by the people's representatives in a national assembly. End of Villacazi, back to me. The process of transformation of the school systems involves convincing those in power to allow a process of placing the management of schools in the hands of those who have the greatest interest in ensuring their proper running. This will serve the long-term interests of the people and the economy. Perhaps the current state of flux in the land will bring forth far-sighted and magnanimous leaders who, among all the other concerns relating to the political economy, will at least be able to talk about community control of state-funded education. Certainly the resistance and survival tactics of the past dozen years have become, begun to respond to religious state oppression so as to become not browbeaten but more subtle and proactive in their strategies for the empowerment of oppressed people. Thus the MDM, Mass Democratic Movement, is not a persona that can be banned. Its leadership is dispersed and capable of being renewed and replaced, and a perceptible process of empowerment is already beginning to find its expression in the way in which the oppressed see the schools. No longer as outposts for waging a drawn-out battle with the forces of oppression, but rather as places where the process of learning can be set in motion now. And so the third question posed for discussion, should parents be able to decide what their children should be taught, or should this be decided by the government? At an elementary level, there are certain basic matters relating to literacy, numeracy, and the acquisition of other basic skills, which, them, which in themselves are seldom seen as controversial. What does produce controversy, however, is the manner in which these skills are acquired. Do they become part of the intellectual apparatus of the individual as the consequence of a process of instruction? This is the favorite term of departmental bureaucrats who are steeped in the traditions of CMO and fundamental pedagogics for describing what happens in a classroom. Or are they acquired as part of an holistic process of learning that involves the use of the classroom as a resource base and the teacher as a concerned facilitator of the learning process. There is no doubt in my mind that student uprisings have been directed as much against authoritarian so-called teaching at the micro level as against macro phenomena encapsulated in the existence of the 17 racially divided education departments. Children and young adults need to interact with their peers and their teachers in environments that are conducive to learning. Students need to be relatively free of stress. They require physical space in which to move. They require resources in the form of books and apparatus. They need to be encouraged to pursue independent lines of investigation. They need to know what is important to learn for themselves, how to think. They can do without the rote learning and the detailed syllabus pres of prescribed knowledge which is the stock in trade of fundamental pedagogics. Many parents, themselves the products of the traditional South African way of teaching, might need reassurance about the value of a holistic, learning-based approach to school activity. This highlights a tension 
that is integral in relationships between managers and professional workers in any field of endeavour. Managers need to be realistic in their setting of goals. Professionals should be reasonable. Uh, professionals should be accorded full participation in determining whether goals are reasonable and attainable, and they, the professionals, should have a major responsibility for carrying them into practice. Within schools, this demands the creation of trust between the parties concerned, students, parents, and teachers. Hence the notion of the PTSA, Parent Teacher Students Association. And it also, of course, involves trust with other clients of the school system, such as employers and the tertiary institutions. This trust will emerge when there is freedom for communities and teachers to work together in the interests of their children. It cannot be attained through the intervention of security policemen, the presence of security forces on campuses, the imposition of government-conceived structures on communities, nor the harassment and detention of those, such as members of the NECC, who work at grassroots level to develop this trust and cooperation. And so we need to hear less in the press and elsewhere about the poor qualifications and inadequacies of teachers. We should concentrate our discussions more on the context in which teachers are asked to exercise their responsibilities. Release teachers from the constraints of CNO dogmatism. Give them environments which recognize their professional integrity, poorly qualified in a technical sense as they might be. Discipline those who fall short of reasonable standards of professional conduct. Reward those who show a passion for the needs and aspirations of their students. And give teachers and students the basic resources necessary for them to do a good day's work. In such a climate, our much maligned and much abused teachers will certainly surprise us at what they will be able to achieve. Then schools will begin to exercise their responsibilities to help young people understand the basic principles of democracy. They will then send out students who not only have essential basic skills, but who are intellectually, spiritually, and economically on the road to self-reliance. Such people are intrinsic to the evolution of a free society, which itself is the prerequisite to the promotion of a free market economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Cork. This has really been enlightening. But I'm afraid we cannot ask questions now. We shall allow the next speaker to speak to us, and then after that we'll have questions. This is because we have very little time. So please bear with us. Now I introduce Mr. Eustace Davy. Eustace Davy is a chartered accountant and has been involved with the Free Market Foundation since its inception in 1977. He served as an FMF council member until 1980 when he took on his present position as Administrative Director. At the Free Market Foundation, he specialized in the area of taxation, privatization, and education. He is also Chairman of the Montessori Society of South Africa and a, broad member, a board member of the Montessori Primary School. His topic this morning is Choice in education. Choice in education. Thank you very much. Is it working?
as you have just heard from Michael Cork, Adam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have choice in education in South Africa. As a result, many people are unhappy. They're unhappy with the system as it is, and they'd like to see change. Without choice, there is uniformity, drabness, boredom, and discontent. And we see it all over South Africa, all around us, as far as education is concerned. Now the question to ask is, why don't we have choice in education? I would contend, and I agree with Michael Cork, that it is because we have so-called free and compulsory schooling in South Africa under the control of government. And what does this essentially mean? It means that we have strangers, taxpayers, paying for our children's schooling. And we have other strangers, education departments, deciding everything about their schooling what they will learn, where they will learn, how they will learn, when they will learn, and who they will learn from. These strangers decide all those things for our children, as far as our children's education is concerned. And let me dis illustrate the effect of this kind of decision by applying it to something else. Look what happens when you have compulsory government housing. When they say you can have any house you like as long as it's this one, this matchbox. I think the people of Soweto and other towns understand that kind of thing. And what would it be like if the government provided free and compulsory shoes? Again, strangers, taxpayers, would be paying for your shoes, and other strangers, bureaucrats in Pretoria, would be deciding everything about those shoes and forcing you to wear them. And what if they didn't like the way you walked? Maybe you've got a happy walk, you know? And they decide they don't like that, and they're going to fix the shoes so that you don't walk in such a happy fashion. Can you imagine what shoes would be like if they were designed by bureaucrats in Pretoria Bureaucrats who think you don't walk in the right way and they want to change the way you walk. And how would you be, how do you think you'd be walking then? And they tell you which shoes to wear and you've got to wear them, whether they fit or not. The right size doesn't matter to them. How would you walk? I think you'd be walking something like this. And that is the kind of education we have in South Africa that goes like this. And what about our children? Do we, I mean we think it's ludicrous when we talk about shoes, letting them decide what kind of shoes we should wear, but should we leave the dis important decisions about the education of our children in the hands of strangers in Pretoria? Would we, should we do that? when we wouldn't trust them to choose shoes for us? There is an old saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. But it doesn't work like that when you come to taxation. 
Those who pay the taxes don't decide how the money is going to be spent. We have the taxation middleman, the one who takes the taxes and, takes, uh, and also decides how it's to be spent. And this is particularly true of South Africa. The taxpayers in South Africa, many of them who are paying taxes, have no say whatsoever in how the money is to be spent. And you can see the result in the kind of education that is provided. Now what are we to do about this problem? How do we change the system? How do we give people greater choice in education? I think I've demonstrated what the problem is. We know that it is because government is in control of education. The solution must then be to get government out of education. But of course this is easier said than done. Such a drastic change will be difficult to achieve while parents labor under the illusion that they are getting something for nothing. That someone else is paying for something that they would otherwise have to pay for. Maybe some of the cost is shifted to someone else. I'm not so sure about that. But I think the price is too high. The price is too high in the lost opportunities of their children, the unhappiness, the frustration. I think it's definitely a price that is too high to pay. And of course, then the fact that government, or let me rephrase that, the fact that taxpayers pay for education doesn't mean that government has to provide it. The taxpayers can pay and others can provide it. It can be privately provided. It can be provided in such a way that the consumers of education have a choice. There are different wo various ways that this can be done. There are education vouchers there are tax credits and there is another method called capitation funding which I'll come back to later. If parents want choice, better schooling, greater opportunities and a better future for their children, they have a fundamental decision to make. They can get these things if they say to government, we will pay for the education of our children. You, on your part, must undertake to withdraw from education altogether. Remove the compulsory schooling legislation. We will take responsibility for our children's future. Don't try and set standards. We can decide on such things for ourselves. Don't tell us what language our children are learning. That is our own business. Don't interfere in any way. Our children are ours to care for. That can be achieved if we are prepared to say those things. And I know that what I'm suggesting is a dis difficult decision for parents to take, especially poor parents. But these decisions have been taken in community-based education, what Michael Cork referred to just now, people's education. Courageous people have already pointed the way. Their example can be followed and expanded upon. When you look at the early history of South Africa, 
government has not always provided and controlled education. In the time of Paul Kruger, government was not involved in education. Schools were all private, and 90% of children attended school. Sorry, let me rephrase that. 90% of white ch children attended school. But many, many, a large percentage of black, of black children, especially in the towns. And also, earlier, there was a lot of private education provided. Michael Re Cork referred to it. The, uh, whether the churches provided education, provided schools. And those schools were destroyed. How were they destroyed? And the infamous, when the infamous Bantu Education Act came into, into being, uh, what they did to destroy the schools was to refuse to recognize the qualifications of the teachers. And they stopped them teaching in that way. We can also see in the history of Great Britain, England, how during that great period of advance, when there were tremendous improvements in the earnings of people in Britain during the 19th century, all education was private. In other words, an evolving society advancing at a rapid rate with all education privately provided. Most children went to school, 90% uh, of them approximately again, according to, to the historians. And what was the result? Was it poor? Were the people educated? The findings are that there was a high level of literacy in Britain at that time. Most children attended school for five years, from the age of six to the age of 11. And uh, according to many commentators, uh, that is perhaps uh, the amount of time um, that most people should spend at school, five years, to learn to read, write, and do arithmetic. Most of what we learn otherwise is learned outside school. They had such a high level of literacy that the government didn't like it. They didn't like the common man coming up so fast and being able to read and write. So they introduced a paper tax. A paper tax, and that was designed to slow down the rate of improvement in the education of the people. In 1830, a government got involved for the first time in British education by introducing subsidies. In 1870, compulsory education was induced, introduced for the first time and a few government schools were built. The destruction of the British education system took only 10 years. By 1880, most of the English schools had been taken over by the government. Most of the schools. Now what do we do in South Africa? The things that we want out of the hands of government are the appointment of teachers, the curriculum, the ab abolition of zoning so that there's no zoning so the schools can decide for themselves which children to take in, and then the question of funding. It is not true to say that equality in funding of education has to take many, many years. It can be done tomorrow. All you ta do is take the number of children at school in South Africa, divide it by the total education bill, and provide funding on that basis. It's called capitation funding. That schools are funded 
on the basis of the number of children attending that school. This is what Margaret Thatcher is doing in Britain at the moment. She's changing the education system. Schools are allowed to opt out. And these are the rights. The ones I've just mentioned here are the rights that these schools are being given and they're being funded on a per capita basis. That can be done in South Africa tomorrow. There are schools north of here that are thinking along these lines. I'm talking about government schools, white schools, who want the right to allow anybody they choose to come into their, sco into their schools. They want to be able to appoint teachers. They want more control and it can be done by community-based education with a community in control of the schools and that can be done very quickly in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eustace Davy. This is, has been quite interesting to know what other countries are doing. Now, you have had the two speakers, ladies and gentlemen. You are now allowed 10 minutes for questions. Um, we'll start with this gentleman here. Any other hands, please, to make it speak? Give us a chance. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Humphrey Corza from Shell. Linking privatization, healthcare, and education. Whilst I'm a strong believer in privatization, I'm a little concerned as regards privatization of community services. Now, looking at countries that opted or countries that have privatized, what has been the implications in terms of the end user, the consumer, particularly in the underprivileged communities. I'm thinking now of South Africa, that the masses of black people who can't even have access, some of them can't have access even to the so-called free education. What's going to happen when education get privatized, hospital services get privatized? Because with my little knowledge, rather with my little thinking, I think perhaps we will have a group of better, of better quality schools which will attract better teachers and only those people that can afford will send their children to those type of schools and then we'll end up with a disparity once again, if I may just be clarified on that point. Yes, I thought I was trying to move away from the notion of privatization um, for the specific advantage of the uh, uh, of the rising middle class, and it's for that reason that I tried to dwell on the problem of the highly oppressed in this country. I think you're quite right to say that um, uh, a, a total throwing of education um, into private hands um, for the uh, majority of the people um, is probably not going to be politically acceptable in the new South Africa because of the enormous backlogs that have to be made up and the affirmative action that needs to be practiced um, uh, in support of kids and whole generations of people who have lost out on the education process. Therefore, what I was trying to talk about was in fact the obligation of the state to provide the funds on an equitable basis and also, I might add, on a compensatory basis in other words, putting it bluntly, we need to put more money towards the education of people who have been traditionally and historically <coughs> oppressed and less towards the privileged communities. In that sense, I'm a social democrat. Um, we have to do that, and we have to go along with, um, I believe, what the um, proponents of people's education are talking about, that is putting power over the control of schools into the hands of local communities. Local communities not uh, defined in terms of irrelevant racial and ethnic criteria, but in straight community terms. Let communities run their own schools, let the state provide the funding. 
Leon Lowe and Francis Kendall have talk, talked in their book, their recent book about the, um, about the Swiss model, and it seems to me that that is an eminently suitable model. I might add that I don't believe that the state can provide the uh, curricula that local communities want, and um, perhaps I'll put in a plug now for a new organization in the field called the Independent Examinations Board, which, of which I'm the chairman and which um, uh, Leon Lowbury kindly mentioned in his book as being a step in the direction of privatization. But it's more important than that, it's a step in the direction of community service. Because although we have used private sector funds to set this thing up in order to do curriculum development and run examinations in the place of the Joint Matriculation Board, um, our fundamental objective is to get in with communities and actually encourage communities to put state schools um, under pressure to allow those schools to opt out of the curricula and the examinations supplied by departments of education and come over to the IEB. I might also add the IEB wouldn't object to competition in the field. We believe in a free market in terms of curriculum development. Maybe there could be people there who would, um, uh, who would compete with us and do a better job, and we would like the stimulus of competition. I hope that answers your question. Um, I don't want to dismiss the needs of the poor, and I want to practice affirmative action, put it bluntly, in respect of black people who have been disadvantaged and oppressed historically. Now move on to the mic. Do you want to ask a question? Yes. Why to answer this question, there are two speakers down there. One is there already, and there's a gentleman here. Could you move this way, please? Thank you. I'd just like to comment on this question of funding. Uh, what, I had, what I said just now, I had to say very fast, and perhaps uh, I, I can understand it if people didn't pick up on what I was saying. If you take the total budget of South Africa, education budget today, and you divide it by the number of children in schools, and schools are funded according to the number in the school, it means that all children will be having the same amount of money spent on them, no matter where they are. In other words, um, there's no, there will be no discrimination as far as funding is concerned. Those schools at the moment that perhaps are spending more on their children, if the amount received from the state is insufficient to make up the cost of the education of the schooling in that school, they will have to find it from the parents or elsewhere. That is the way it would work. So capitation funding, if introduced, would put all schools on an equal footing as far as funding is concerned. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Ken Lameni. I'm an official of FEBCOS, which is the foundation for African business and consumer services. When I looked at this session today and the program as such, I thought we'd uh, have a chance of talking about consumer education especially the black consumer in terms of uh, making him more understandable in terms of uh, getting to understand how to use products and the like and improving the products in relation with the consumer but unfortunately we are more concerned here about the state and private education I was a bit disappointed on that score but but we are looking at FEPCOS uh, in conjunction with NBCU, um, a program in which the manufacturers as well as the black consumer ways and means of uh, educating the black consumer in terms of services that are offered by producers and suppliers of, and manufacturers of products. Thank you. I think our brief was actually to talk about um, formal education um, as it affects the growth and development of, um, of young people and we weren't specifically briefed to talk about consumer education. If young people had good education then the consumers wouldn't be having a problem. <laughs>
Thank you. My name is Peter Kitson. I would like to disagree with both of the speakers on education. You're not going to get money from the state and allow the community to control the education. They're just not going to do it. If they, go, if they give you money, they're, they're always going to be strings attached. So what I say is, if you want the community to control its education, cut free of the state. It's the only way the consumer will control education. My response to that, of course, is that we live under an illegitimate state, not just an incompetent government. Yeah, Even more reason to cut free of it. In the, in the new South Africa, we will strive, in fact, for a just democratic um, society which will, in fact, recognize the rights of people at grassroots level. It will be a new South Africa which takes account um, of the need for legitimate local government, not the sort of puppet local governments that are in place at the moment. But no government in the world does it. I'm dreaming now. I just had a brief part that I wanted to add that sort of ties in with your last comment and that I think one of the things that we should look at here is whether we want any government, whether it's a government we vote in, all of us, or whether it's this illegitimate government now, to make decisions for us. Do we want the power individually as consumers to decide how our lives are run or do we want a government, black, white, democratic, undemocratic, to do it for us? I think we need to consider that. Uh, there, there is a hand up there, and I'm afraid it will be the last question. My name is Lukele. I'm a representative of Oscar Bazaar Research Division. <coughs> I just want to find out from Mr. Michael Cock why other private schools are accepting uh, subsidies from the government while the others are refraining from accepting it. Thank you. That's a nice question. You want to know why some private schools accept subsidies and others don't? I can tell you why St. Barnabas College doesn't accept a subsidy. It's because subsidies, by and large, for private schools are larger per capita um, than the amount which is spent on the most disadvantaged people in the public system of education. And we would therefore find it unfair for us to accept a subsidy under those conditions. Um, subsidies also vary uh, according to whether a school is registered as a so-called white school or some other kind of school. And therefore, um, we and a number of other schools find um, that sort of thing unacceptable, and we use our initiative to raise money elsewhere in order to provide um, very considerable bursaries for kids who come from homes which would never be able to afford independent education. But not all independent schools are able to do that, and I have to tell you that the vast majority um, uh, uh, actively um, seek government subsidy and seek it on the, uh, on the best possible terms. And that really is a matter for their consciences, but it's also a matter for their, um, for their survival. Some of us are able to take the, um, the high moral ground, um, others are less able to do so, and we have to respect the rights of those who do decide to accept government subsidies. I might add that those subsidies very often carry with them not overt conditions, but at least covered conditions. There have been plenty of studies done in North America, uh, one particularly in, um, in, Bank, uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in one of the Western provinces of Canada, which have showed that the moment um, private schools begin to su accept substantial state subsidies, um, in, a, in a very quiet and unobtrusive way, they begin to mirror the state system themselves. And I believe that that happens in many cases in this country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, the topics this morning were very interesting and they were fairly dealt with. It is now time for tea. We'll break now and come back after 20 minutes. Thank you very much.
I'll keep these. Those are Eustace's, so I'll keep those. You win Billy Jenkins. You gave your first speaker ten minutes. You gave the last two five minutes each. Uh, yes, you only gave us five minutes each for the, the last two questions. No, no, yes. Or that's the questions are mm -hmm. the most but important. But ma'am, that, that's fair enough. We understood that before we started. Well, that no. was made clear to us. Oh, well, it yeah. wasn't clear to us. Mm. We were told then that... No, no, the umpire was okay. <laughs> yes, but you didn't give each of the last two before us. Quite simple, darling. You know how it is. I did learn some. We had, we had already... A, the speakers knew that had to You had ten minutes. Because I only stayed for about ten or fifteen minutes. I didn't speak for my full twenty minutes. I know, I know. I know. But that was your choice, mm -hmm. I presume. The speakers knew beforehand that testing one, two, one, two. Had ten minutes for questions. Who's the man who never talked about some bombs? This one? No, it was the other one. Testing one, no, it was this one. What's his name? Uh, Michael Cork. Cork. Testing one, two, one, two. Like cabinets, we swing it over like this, and then you, except then you like, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah.